second. Hi everyone. Hi. Hi, my name is Tara Noble. I am the National Relationship Manager for the Cancer Association and we are live from the Cancer Devon offices in KZM. And we'd just like to thank Sunday Tribune for giving us this fantastic opportunity to chat with you and just share some insights um, from myself as a social worker and from our wonderful guest, Kim, as a breast cancer survivor. So, Kim, I'm going to hand over to you now just to chat a little bit more about yourself um, and to share with our viewers. Okay, so my name is Kim Gillis, and I was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 32. Whilst just going about my life normally, um, I don't have any family history of breast cancer on either side and bumped myself one day in the shower, found a lump, and then ignored it, like most women do. Mm -hmm. And then a week later, went to a doctor for an unrelated issue, and she said, let's do some blood tests, did that. There was cancer markers that were slightly elevated in those blood tests, which raised flag for me and pushed me to want to go and have a mammogram, which is not something I would have usually done, given my age, but I'd, my gut feeling just was go have a mammogram because usually you don't feel it. Yeah, and I think that actually is quite a challenge. We have quite a few women that are finding signs and symptoms and are actually having difficulty actually getting a mammogram done. And, and, and now, Kim, I'd just like to ask you where do you think, um, do you think at that age of 32 that you would have ever actually examined your breast? No, I, I was not regular with my breast exam, not so, at all. So you had never examined your breast before? I had, but not as frequently as you should. I wasn't doing it monthly mm -hmm. like I should. So if you didn't have that little bit of a fall in the shower and didn't examine your, and, and, and didn't then obviously now feel your breast, where do you think you'd be today? I would have probably had, for the type of cancer that I had, I probably would have had a really aggressive stage or not even be here at all. So I think that's one really, really important thing to note is that you do need to examine your breast monthly. I think people are, they often say, who should do a, a breast examination monthly? And I always say, if you have a boob or a breast, that means you. Um, and it also includes men. I think it's also sometimes a very taboo topic because sometimes men, it's a bit more difficult to say they have breast cancer or the thought of a man having breast cancer. But unfortunately, it is happening. We do know men that are being affected and that actually are suffering from breast cancer. And the symptoms are very similar. So the more you know your body, the better we can treat you and take care of you. So please, guys, doing breast examinations is so, so very important monthly. So, Kim, um, please tell us a bit more about what was your treatment journey like? Um, and, and how did you actually process your diagnosis of someone telling you, Kim, you have breast cancer? So the processing part is <laughs> kind of the hard part because there's so many emotions that you are faced with when you are diagnosed. Just hearing those words alone, you have mm -hmm. breast cancer, that totally turned my world into a tailspin because having no history, having virtually no knowledge or very minimal mm -hmm. knowledge of the, of the illness, it, just, it was just so confusing for me. Mm -hmm. um, but my surgeon explained to me what the procedure would be, and it was chemotherapy. It was going to be surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and hormone therapy. So all big words new to me, um, which we had to go through stage by stage. And um, looking back on it now, I, I think I would have needed a little bit of time or more time to process it, because that's the hardest part. You get told that you need to do stuff and you go into survivor mode, and you just want to do, 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 and you don't think. You don't give yourself that time to breathe. Mm -hmm. It's so important to actually just take a step back, understand what you're going to have to go through and understand the side effects that are going to follow mm -hmm. it, because there's definitely going to be, and just process what you need, to, what's going to be ahead for you. Um, I also think that's actually such an important point, because also as family members and loved ones, sometimes we're like, okay, we know this diagnosis, mom, sister, auntie, and we're going to help you. We're going to push you. We're going to go tomorrow. And there's this very like much of a, like, not excitement, but you could say that. Like, like, like excitement <laughs> and cheerleaders. And we want to help you and make it better. But I think the reality is also as people that love someone that has breast cancer, you need to also understand, or, or actually any kind of cancer, you also have to understand that this person has just literally been told the most insane news it's as kim was just saying now 
trying to process like, oh my gosh, what is it? What are all those terms? What are you guys actually going to do to me? Um, what does all of this mean for, for, for my future, for my job, for my relationships? It's so much needs to be processed. And I think we also need to give people the opportunity to process. And I'm not saying mourn in a negative way, but um, dealing with grief and loss is also an important part of a cancer diagnosis because your life is going to go on hold for a period. It, it is not going to be exactly the same for the next one, two, sometimes three, four years. And so a cancer patient, and obviously now it's about breast cancer patients, need that time. It might be a week or two, it might be a little bit more, but as it's coming out with chatting earlier, it is so normal and so important to actually allow patients to have time to process what is going to happen to them. Mm -hmm. um, and then when they have that time, they'll be more prepared and ready, as you said, then to go and fight and get mm -hmm. ready for it. But that time in the beginning to kind of wrap your head around things and figure out a plan and how's your family going to be affected, et cetera, is actually so, so important in terms of a cancer patient's journey. You know, they need to have that right to be able to process. And we also know with different responsibilities, some of us are looking after our parents or you have some more children or you have brothers and sisters or family members that you're looking after. Um, all of those things need to come into consideration. And I think women bear a lot of the brunt yes. where, um, where, where I think, you know, sometimes you feel like I actually can't process this or I'm not allowed to because everyone's hungry for dinner and everyone needs me now and mm -hmm. the kids want me here. But I think realistically, you also need to realize that at this very stressful time of your life as a woman, you also need yourself. Yes. And the people around you that love you and care for you would really hope that they would be as supportive as, as needed and they would also help you through this time and give you a little bit of grace to hopefully help with those responsibilities just to give you an evening or some mornings just to help you get through it. Um, so Kim, when it does come to processing um, your cancer diagnosis, what are things that you did um, that you feel that helped you um, cope and wrap your head around it and for you to actually make the decision of, okay, I'm going to get, go through this and I'm going to do it? So for me, acceptance came very quickly just because that's my personality type. Like, I'm very resilient. I'm I'm always just going to follow the plan and do what I need to do to get the, the outcome that I need. But I I did take the time to not go and Google research everything and Google diagnose myself. I, I had honest and frank conversations with my doctors mm -hmm. about what my treatment was going to be and what the side effects are going to be because... When somebody hears that you have cancer, the first thing they say, oh, you're going to lose your hair. Mm -hmm. No, it's actually more than you're going to lose your hair. You're going to be sick for days at a time. You're going to be poked and prodded and constantly you're going to go in and out of hospitals and see doctors and you spend more time in your oncology suite than you actually do at home. Mm -hmm. And you, you, everything about your life just changes. So for me, I really took time and focused on myself and focused on my healing and changed my mindset because I, I'm a firm believer that your mind controls your body and if I, my mind can tell my body you know we're fighting this we're going to do that and it, it's so important that a cancer patient just takes the time to accept that they're going to go through this unfortunately you are fighting your own body mm. but but you can do it if you just have the right mindset for it so yeah it's it's all about thinking and planning mm. And what about a support system? I know as a social worker, um, um, we do always say, um, as a social worker, I know from our side, um, we do know the definite value and support that a support system plays. Um, and I can just see here a comment from Nicole Fuller. She says, Car, your life is never, ever the same after a cancer diagnosis. It is a forever um, ongoing journey. Mm -hmm. And Kim, what do you say I, to the first one? I always say that no matter whether you are in remission or not, you always look under this cancer cloud because mm -hmm. once you hear the diagnosis, you know that your life is forever going to be cancer. It's always going to be there. Even when they take the tumors out or when you, you are completely clear, you always have this fear. It's an innate fear in you. And for younger women who are diagnosed with cancer as well, everybody who's diagnosed younger, the re risk of reoccurrence is actually quite higher. Mm. So your your lifestyle has to change completely. Mm. It's, it's it's not just diet and exercise, it's mindset, it's, it's everything that affects being able to do your job. Uh, like that. There is no 
previous norm. Now it's a new norm that you need to find. Yeah. And and I think a lot of people struggle with that when when diagnosed. So I I fully agree with with Nicole that you it'll always be there for you. Mm. It's, it's just something that's with you forever. Um, and I think it's something I also want to chat about is that now, so um, with Tim now, you know, she's gone through the difficult time of being diagnosed of, uh, as we said earlier, having all of those challenges with processing a diagnosis, she's gone through the rigorous treatment. But now Kim is also at a stage where she's completed her treatment mm -hmm. and now she's trying to figure out who is Kim. Um, uh, who is, and I think it's so, it's so great what you said, Kim, you said, um, the new norm, mm -hmm. the new normal. And I think the question is, who is the new Kim after having a cancer diagnosis? And for me, especially about expectations from loved ones, like, for example, I want some close friends who were cancer survivors. They would do 10Ks running a day, and they had the most amazing group of friends with their running clubs and people in their lives, but they haven't been able to do running in, like, two years. The other day, she tried, like, a 2K, and she was just... For the bone marrow transplants, it was so overwhelming for her, um, and she and she's actually lost those group that group of friends. And then, so you just found that you just have to kind of like re adapt, like, like adapt and and kind of like like reinvent yourself. Yeah. Um, do you want to share? Um, maybe yeah. have you had any like some experiences or share with us who is the new Kim? No, definitely. So the previous Kim worked in a corporate environment. So always at work, always at functions, and a workaholic. The new Kim now has to stop and listen to her body all mm -hmm. the time. Yeah. Because with my treatment, I'm on hormone therapy. And hormone therapy is basically, I'm 35 now, has put me into menopause. So yes, I have the hot flushes and the body aches, and I go through anxiety, depression, insomnia, all of it. And all with that combination, just the three, anxiety, insomnia, and depression together, slows your body down so much. And that affects you cognitively mm -hmm. as well. Um, so there are days where I can get up and I can do three interviews with you and be perfectly fine. And then there are days where I can get up and be, no, I think I just need to pull the covers back over and spend my day in bed because my body hurts. My body is exhausted. My mind is exhausted as well. I just need time to deal with me and, and and take care of me because I'm going through this. It's a real thing that I am going through. And I've learned that the new norm is to take each day as it comes. Live each day to the fullest mm -hmm. because tomorrow is not promised to anybody. Cancer may not kill me. Something else may kill me. But I am going to live every day to mm -hmm. its absolute fullest. And I try to do that by sharing my story with as many people as I can to give them hope and to encourage them that they can live unapologetically who they are because when you are diagnosed with cancer or any severe illness for that cancer, it forever changes your life and your identity. Mm -hmm. And the new person that you become is the person you should be proud of and go forth with. Don't ever feel stigmatized, oh, I've got cancer, so please pity me. No, that, that's not the way to go. Life is for living. Mm -hmm. So... For me, that's the new norm now, the new Kim. Always. Um, and, and I'd like to say, you know, Kim is the tender age of 35 and she's absolutely gorgeous. You don't even know for a second that she has ever been through any health issue or anything like that. She also had a lumpectomy done, so obviously she still has her breast, which she's really, really, really blessed about. I didn't have to have a lumpectomy. But at the end of the day, something that I often like to chat about is, is sometimes the response from people when you look healthy and well. Mm. So on the outside, you are gorgeous in makeup, your hair is gorgeous, you dress you well, you still have breath. But now, um, so now technically, and in, in, in some, or some people feel you aren't sick enough to say yeah. you have breast cancer, and then you are not well enough because you can't cook for 50 people mm -hmm. at a family function. So then, like, like, what are you? Who are you? Um, and how do you battle with like those kind of challenges? Because we know, unfortunately, for example, when you when you did have no hair and maybe didn't look good and were in active treatment, um, obviously you wouldn't look you you look sick and you wouldn't look as good as you look as fresh and fantastic as you're looking today. <laughs> um, but in a way, like I, I feel it's actually quite it's really unfair because uh, you, the stigma of it you're being judged on your looks 
Yes. So if you look sick or say, like, oh, I'm so sorry that you are sick and that you're not feeling well um, because you look sick. Yes. But then when you look good, like today, maybe a response would be, well, I never knew, knew that you're actually sick. Are you sure? You just, you, you must be fine. Look at you. You look so great, you know? Oh, yeah. And so, <laughs> yes, you don't have anything. Um, so, yeah. So, we just, so, I don't know. Do, have you had experiences like that? But, Always. Always. I, I get it so often. I walk into a room to do breast cancer talk because that's, that's something I'm really passionate about doing now. And people look at me like, really? You have cancer? And um, yes, it can happen to anybody. It does not at all have its little group of people. It used to, breast cancer used to be the old lady disease. And it, it's so sad to say that, but breast cancer can happen to anybody. Mm -hmm. Cancer can happen to anybody. And I very often get told, oh, but you look so good. You look so well. And I, <laughs> I happen to tell people, if you unzip me <laughs> and you take off my skin, you'll probably see all the problems that are wrong with me because... It's, it's simple things in my life that set me back. So, yes, I've had the lumpectomy. Um, with that, I had sentinel node removal. That has caused lymphedema in my left arm. And also, I can't do any drips in my left arm because this is my affected side. So, basically, it's like an ornament for me to just have this left arm. It's a bangle holder. That's what I call it. And it, it seems fine to everybody. But to me, it's not because I feel as if I can't use the side of my body like I used to. Which is, it, it, it's frustrating because you look fine, but you know you've got all these scars that you bear as well. Mm -hmm. And with cancer, it's not only the physical scars, it's the emotional scars as well. Mm -hmm. And those are the hardest to deal with. Mm -hmm. And I think also that is why it is so important that, you know, when you have someone in your life that does have cancer, whatever the cancer is, that you, we just ask you to come with kindness and come with love. And I think that if a cancer patient is telling you and actually says, you know, I'm not good today, you can't just judge them because they look great like Kim mm -hmm. does today. She's been busy the whole morning, went to prep earlier, she had three meetings, then she came here. By the time she gets home, she's going to be finished because it's, it's harder for her to do those kind of things because still being on hormone treatment, still having to deal with those things, it still takes such a toll on her body. Um, and so, yeah, I'll just have a call for kindness, please, and lots of extra love and understanding um, instead of possibly, like, allegations and distrust and possibly judging yeah. um, a person's, like, right to care. And we don't want sympathy, but empathy towards yeah. someone based on the fact that she looks really great today and kind of discredits what she's gone through and what her body's going through. Yeah. Um and I think sometimes, um, yeah, oh, sorry, there's a comment from Nicole here. Nicole's actually also a breast cancer survivor. Um, yeah, she's amazing. She's also a cancer volunteer. And she says, you're an inspiration, Kim. So good that you're getting out there. It gives you a sense of purpose. It well, does, absolutely. It's, this is my purpose. I, I say it, it's on my arm to live my purpose all the time. I firmly believe that although cancer happened to me, it took away a lot from me, but it's given me my purpose because... I will forever speak about how to thrive with your disease because I choose to be called a thriver because I'm still going through treatment. I'm not yet in remission. I haven't fully survived yet, but I'm thriving because I take every day as it comes and I will do whatever it takes to beat this disease and help anybody along the way. Mm. And I also think that it's so important, you know, I think as, a, as someone that's gone through cancer, still going through cancer, um, and trying to create a new life. I think at the age of 35, technically, you're supposed to be the prime of your life. And it still is the prime of your life because the way you live your life, Kim, and, and the example you set and your fearlessness to just keep on going despite it all is amazing. I really hope that it's going to um, inspire a lot of other women out there that maybe have other breast cancers or just any other cancer that you can do it. But I think a lot of stuff Kim has said about being kind to yourself and listening to your body, I think those are really key. Those so, are important. Uh, that like, is the most important part of healing. Because you are the same person. And mm. I think I think this is it's very difficult to mm. say that out loud. But um and it's not in a in a and that's the thing. We're having a real talk now. We are not talking in any way negatively, but we're just being realistic that the Kim prior cancer mm -hmm. and the Kim now is a different person. Physically, emotionally, mentally, everything. Like I used to be the girl with the long hair. I had blonde hair before <laughs> for like almost 10 years. And then I lost my hair. And then my hair grew back. I was like, okay, I'm just going to own 
my black hair. Okay, stop going now because that happens with cancer treatment too. <laughs> but guess what? I don't care. These are my wisdom highlights. Cancer has taught me something so real, and I'm not going to mm. shy away from it. The stigma is there. Yes, that people should look a certain way, like I should be thick, thin, and sickly. Guess what? I gained weight on treatment. That's what people don't tell you. Some people lose weight from the nausea. Some people gain weight. I'm trying to fight this weight and get it off. Mm. And and these are the things that I, that's what I'm saying, be kind to yourself, accept it. My oncologist always says to me, I'm so proud of you, you've lost like so many kgs now. And I'm like, but that's not enough. I need to lose more. I, I'm not right where I should be. And I, I'm very hard on myself mm. about it. But as hard as I am on myself about it, I do know I have to be kind to myself about it. I can't control my body and the side effects of all the medications that I have to be on. But I can do something out there in the world and help people get through it as well mm -hmm. and build this, I don't know, community of upliftment when it comes to cancer. Mm -hmm. Because yes, we have COVID going on, but cancer is still around too. And we also need support and help and love because we are affected so badly mm -hmm. by it. Yeah. No, I, I think 100%. And I think it's also so important to know that support is out there. And I think the, the COVID angle of things has really made a cancer patient situation a hell of a lot more complicated. Um, we know that um, previously with the Cancer Association, we have we have 23 cancer care centers nationwide, and we we know that we have you know we normally do support groups, we normally do one-on-one -on -one counseling with patients and family members. All of that had to stop. Um, and during COVID, we really had to be a lot more creative um, and we had to think of some interesting things. So something we actually did bring along was cancer telephonic counseling service. So you can call us on 0800 22 can um, or you can email us at counseling at cancer, C-A-N-S-A, dot org, dot today to make an appointment. It could be you as a cancer patient. It could be a loved one. Maybe it's your sister, your brother. The, your caregiver, someone that's actually actively involved in your treatments and, and taking care of you. Um, and yeah, they are. They also need some support. And Kim, I'd actually like to ask you about that. I think everyone is very focused on the cancer patient, which is mm -hmm. obviously important. But people often forget about the family members, mm -hmm. the caregivers, those at home. So we have them, these most amazing oncologists, nurses, doctors, physios, I think Kim Ratter, but how many people mm -hmm. were an amazing psychologist, so many people, that social, social workers that were part of her journey, mm -hmm. but what about those people at home? What about those people that when you come back from chemo and putting you in the bath and walking you out and taking you everyday to treatment, um, how, how did you feel that your journey impacted your family? For me, um, my family, when I told them, it was like the hardest thing to have to say to them, they were all sitting around me and I said, okay, so you guys know I was being tested and um, I, I just was being told that I do have breast cancer. And I literally watched the life drain from their faces, like my parents. I'm an, I'm an only daughter after having three sons, so I'm the baby. My brothers were very protective of me. My sisters-in-law immediately filled up with tears. My brothers were beside themselves. And I, I realized in that moment, it's going to be so difficult for my family to see me go through this. So I, I was at the time I visited it as a champ. I firmly believe that it's the journey is more difficult for the person who's supporting you on the sidelines. And as a cancer patient, we do get wrapped up in our emotions at times and we do lash out at the people who are closest to us. And I apologize for everybody. <laughs> um, because it, it's very true that the emotions do run really wild with you. But it's the support is definitely needed for families. They need to be able to speak because they're so afraid to speak to us and hurt our feelings because we're going through it. And unfortunately, as much as they want to put their arm there or put the boards in and take the chemo for us, they can't. We have to do it. And the support that cancer offers to the families is, is really an intricate part of the journey because families can break up, relationships mm -hmm. can be broken. And when you have cancer patients who are passing on from the disease because they lost their, their fight, the support is so needed for them. During that time, accepting that diagnosis, because I've, I've been through it with my, my friend passing and my uncle and having the disease, I thought, okay, I could do this. But the grief hit me so bad because I was on the other side supporting and I felt like I failed them. And it wasn't that I failed them, it's that I gave them 
the best possible care I possibly could um, in that time. And I supported them through it and held them up. And, and I, I still do that now by, by going out and speaking about it as much as I could. So I, I really do applaud the network that cancer has to help families who are going through this because support is definitely needed. 100%. And I think also that it is okay to say you're not okay. I think this is also a conversation can I previously where, as you said, she's trying to do it like a champ and do it on her own and she doesn't want to impact her family too much. She doesn't want to stress them out. Um, do you know what I mean? And just basically saying that it is so um, important um, for her to to know that her family can also get some support. And I, I, I think it's so, so important that it's not because you're not coping. It's because if you just have a safe space um, and you can talk to someone, you can actually cope even better than what you have than what you are doing. So I think people people must not look at, at asking for help as weakness. No. But it almost needs to be like empowerment. Yeah. So that you're asking for help to help you cope better and for, to help you do an even better job being a caregiver, looking after your loved one, or just even really understanding the illness. Yes. It's so complex. It's a whole new language. It's a whole new language. It's a new life. You know, like, you know, you hear about it, you see it on TV and the movies, but um, nothing like the movies. <laughs> and, 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 but now suddenly your sister or wife or husband or daughter has cancer and you're like, oh my gosh, what are the side effects of chemotherapy? What does this mean for my family? It's, you're literally just wrapping your head around just so much at once. And I think the, also the blessing about our telephone counseling service is that it's in seven languages. So it's in English, Afrikaans, Saswati, Setswana, Isisulu, and Isikosa, and Sisutu. So you can choose to have a counseling session in the language of your choice in the comfort of your own home. I think it's really, really important that we can reach as many South Africans as possible. As Kim said earlier, I always say cancer is not racist. It literally doesn't care about your age, how much is your bank account. If you are 32, like Kim was, Kim's now the gorgeous tender age of 35. Mm -hmm. um, whatever your age is, your race is, if you're poor or rich, um, unfortunately, it is affecting South Africans from all different walks of life. Um, and that's why the service that cancer offers needs to also try and support as many people from as many communities as possible. So as we did uh, chat previously, um, you can call us on 0800 for a free counseling session. You can book it with us. We'll call you back at our cost. Um, and as social workers uh, do, we do four to six sessions with you. So it's not just a once-off call. Maybe you need a once-off call. Maybe you need a bit more, but uh, cancer is there for you. We share to offer support to patients. Um, and it's very important to know that you are not alone. And I think, Kim, um, also hearing your story and hearing how blessed you were with support, I think you are, I don't know if you realize how blessed you actually are, because you have a lot of patients that don't have that support. Their family doesn't react well. Sometimes it's so hard for the family to deal with someone's diagnosis. They actually can't even be a part of it because they just emotionally cannot handle um, a loved one's diagnosis. And I think here we have... Leilani, she says, what a wonderful session with such important um, with such important information shared for cancer patients and families. Thank you so much, Leilani, for joining us today. Um, yeah. And then, yes, uh, uh, thanks for calling again. Does cancer does not discriminate. And, and, I, and I think there's such a misconception from the general public because they aren't involved in cancer every day. So, for example, you know, from the Cancer Association and from Kim, some are being in a chemo suite, mm -hmm. being with doctors in oncology. I think you can visibly see that literally, as my dad would say, every man and his dog is in the chemo suite. Um, it's definitely not for a certain type of people. Um, I know sometimes, you know, there, there's in South Africa we have our stigmas. There's also been a lot of stigma about cancer affecting a lot of white women um, mm -hmm. or being a more majority white disease. But that is also definitely so, so untrue. Yeah, that's, that's and, absolute, yeah, and, absolutely. and with breast cancer, it's the number one, according to the South African Registry, it's the number one cancer amongst all women of all races. So it doesn't really make a difference. It's, it's the number one affected cancer. And I think something that Kim also said earlier, which was important, she never thought that she had to examine her breast monthly because mm -hmm. there was no breast cancer in her family. So a lot of people know um, that if, may, and, and maybe you don't actually know, but if you do have breast cancer in your direct line, if your mom or your sister or your aunt or someone close to you had breast cancer, 
then you do actually have a higher risk mm -hmm. of breast cancer compared to an average person walking down the street, which means from as young as the age of 24, 25, we're encouraging you to do your monthly breast examinations, to advise your gynae mm -hmm. and your GP or health professionals that every time you have your annual checks or anything that you're doing, you would make sure this is included so that they actually know that you do have, you have an underlying history of breast cancer in your family so they can be aware of it to assist you um, and, and really, and just to keep their eyes open. Mm -hmm. So your medical team always needs to know, please, if there is any breast cancer in your family. Mm -hmm. But again, the assumption that because there's nothing in her family that she didn't have to examine her breast, I think is also another challenge. Yeah. So I think monthly breast examinations are just so, so important. It's something that should be really part of our lives. Um, yeah, from teenage girls, from the time they start having their first period, on the 10th day after the first day of their period is when they should be examining their breasts. Women who are menopausal like me, who <laughs> don't have to deal with that anymore, feel it on the first. Set a date in your in your calendar and remind yourself every month on that date to do your breast exam. Put a put a reminder on your phone. Feel it on the first. You got just you got to do it. And you know what? If you don't want to feel it yourself, then just your partner or your husband tell them that they must look after you every month. And I'm sure they will do it because it, oh, you must also realize. Do you know how many lumps are actually found by men? Mm. That's true. Yeah. That's so, really so true. men, uh, all of the men out there that have been so wonderful and on looking after their their their, their ladies' breasts, thank you so much for doing we that. We, we really you. appreciate that. A lot of women tend to find it weird, or a lot of women say to us, "But why?" Oh. <laughs> they say that that, for example, that they don't feel comfortable touching their own breasts yeah, or examining sure. it. Um, and uh, Kim and I were just saying earlier um, that sometimes <laughs> we don't want to get grumpy with the doctors but um doctors do not know what is wrong with you unless you tell them yes why true. because you know your body better that than feels. anyone else so you know when there's a lump you know when there's something weird going on you know that for like, for like let's just talk about some of those breast cancer symptoms hmm. um if you are 48 and you're not breastfeeding why would you have a leaking nipple? Yes. Maybe there's orange skin. There, there is a darkening the and, and, and pigmentation. There's the puckering. Some women wake up in the morning and their nipple has been inverted, which means mm. the nipple's just gone back in. That is not normal. You know your body. You know there are like weird things happening. A lot of other women, they wake up and their breast is dropped completely. Yeah. And you can visibly see that your breast is looking different. Or for example, you put roll-on under your arm and there's a lump underneath mm. there. But you're like, ugh. Oh, I'm just going to leave it because I don't have time or I've got too many other things or my family needs me. So, yeah, I think it's so, so important that you need to be aware of what is going yes. on in your body. And sometimes the symptoms are more visible yes. than others. And sometimes you have to find them. Like I did because mine would hide. It's called a running mouse. It hides. So, so that's what we're trying to say. So, again, if Kim didn't have that situation and didn't buy the whoopsie, mm -hmm. end up feeling her breast and finding that lump, it's just crazy to think if we'd even be here today having this conversation exactly. nearly four years later. Yeah. And the, the video on the website the, of breast cancer examinations, it is the perfect video f to show your partner because it's like, it's so informative and guys can do it. And it's applicable for teenage girls as well. Because I've, I've got my nieces as young as they are. But they have that video. I've shared it with the family. They need to know that they need to do their breast exam. No, definitely. And if you see here now, um, our, our national Facebook has just shared our um, breast examination video. It is really great. It's really simple. Um, we've just made it as simple as possible because it does not have to be a complicated thing. It's also important to know that if you do feel something suspicious or something that you're not sure of, then please, you can go to any cancer care center around the country. We do mm. breast examinations by our nurses for 90 Rand, and we will also gladly um, do you a referral letter, mm -hmm. which you can use at your GP or etc. to get um, a mammogram referral um, or referral to another doctor. So, guys, I think that's one of the most important things we can share. Um, Kim is living proof of someone that by mistake touched her breast. <laughs> 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 it wasn't a planned it monthly wasn't. breast examination, but it was still an amazing opportunity. Um, where she's sitting here with us today, looking gorgeous, beautiful. Again, if you looked her in the street, you'd never even possibly think what she's still and what her body is still going through. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's also really, really important. So Kim, from you, are there any um, 
any words of wisdom um, to all of the people here that possibly don't have cancer and then any words of wisdom to any survivors that are on today? So we had this conversation earlier about mammograms as well. Yes. I just want to throw that in. In the three and a half years that I've been going through mammograms, because they are quite... The machines have improved. It's yeah. not as bad as it used to be because I was petrified of my first mammogram and it was okay. also my diagnostic one. So I was totally put off mammograms, but the machines have improved. The technology is advancing. It is not as painful. It's uncomfortable more than painful because really your breast is getting squashed. But squashing your breast like that is really important and it can save your life. Um, to those people who are going through cancer right now, I'm behind you 150%. I, am, I choose to thrive and I know that you can thrive and you will survive if you have the right mindset. Just tell yourself every day that Life is for living. This is what you're here for. Fight it. You can do it. And for the survivors out there, you guys are my heroes. I, When I'm big, I want to be like you guys. <laughs> I want to say I beat cancer. I'm still in it. I'm still fighting it. But I, can, I cannot do it without having you guys as the example that's just before me. And I love hearing stories of how people have gone through mm. and beat it. So... Let's all just thrive and survive together. Amen. Getting me emotional here as we're trying to wrap up. <laughs> um, thanks so much, Kim. And I think from my side as a social worker um, and someone that works for cancer, you do not have to be alone. That's the only message that we can share. Again, you can, um, we know the way that cancer patients have been threatened during COVID. You know, we do know we need to keep you guys safe. We do know that your oncologists are telling you home and oncology and don't do anything else. Cancer was an essential service during lockdown. Mm -hmm. we, we never stopped and neither did the oncology centers yeah. because cancer illness does Continues. not stop with mm -hmm. COVID or no COVID. And it's so important so that you do not have to be alone. We can yeah. support you. If you would like to come to a cancer care center and get some counseling, please go to www.cancercansa.org.za. Go and find our resources available. We have fact sheets, amazing information on different types of cancers and how to cope. Um, but maybe that, maybe you aren't ready for that and you don't want to actually physically leave mm. your house, then use the telephonic counseling service 0800 226622 or even join one of our Facebook groups. We have amazing closed Facebook groups. The one is called um, uh, Champions of Hope and that's a survivors group that cancer has with the most amazing warrior women and men that are encouraging each other and supporting each other through their journey um, of cancer. Really inspirational. And also about the caregivers we spoke about earlier. We have a Facebook page called Cancer Caring for the Carer. And that's also really important that caregivers also have a platform yes. and a place to actually share and say like guys this is really hard i'm looking after my dad or my sister or my mm. husband and i'm not coping and how are you guys coping so they're both closed groups which means that you have to ask to be a member mm. that anything posted on there won't be able to be seen via family and friends unless they have also asked to become and join and to be a member so there's just other ways we can support you during these COVID times while you are at home keeping safe wearing your mask sanitizing for your life <laughs> social distancing etc yeah so thanks so much everyone uh if there are any questions anyone would like to ask we'll give you guys like a minute or two Thank you, Nicole, for your comments. We were so lovely to have you with us today. Thank you, Nicole. And to everyone else, I can I see, you know, we have Leilani and some other people on, but I can't see who you are. But thank you so much for joining us. And we really hope this has been official and that those that were listening today walked away with something. Um, I know I definitely did. I know with Kim, <laughs> yeah, she's so inspirational. I said to her earlier, she's just Hello. like a walking bundle of joy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how she does it. She just has yeah. this infectious smile. And yeah, she just inspires me so much. So thank you everyone for joining us. We'll wait another minute or so. And then, yeah, and then we're going to close off. And thank you again to Sunday Tribune. We are just so, so grateful. Um, thank you, RJ, for being here as well. So wonderful having you. Thank you so much for Sunday Tribune for the opportunity. Yeah. It's so important that we get to talk about different aspects of cancer. You know, we have to speak about the warning signs and things that are happening um, and obviously early detection and risk reduction is huge but we also need to give breast cancer patients a platform to share and guide us and let us get into their space yeah. so that hopefully we can better understand them and better support them through their journey yeah. 
So it's appreciated. Yeah. It truly is. So thank you, everyone. If anyone would like any more information or mm. queries, you can email me, Cara, that's C-A-R-A, um, at cnoble, C-N-O-B-L-E, at cancer, C-A-N-S-A, dot org, dot Z-A. And if you want to follow, follow Kim on, 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 on any social media, Kim, what are your handles? So I have um, a Thriver page, uh, which is just Thriver, or you could just follow me as Kim Gillett, G-I-L-L-O-T, on Facebook and Instagram. Okay, wonderful. So thank you so much, guys. Have a wonderful afternoon and be kind to those you love with cancer, breast cancer or whatever it is. And thank you for taking the time today. We really, really appreciate it. Keep well. Thank you. Bye.